There are many times in physics that you want to figure out what's going to happen in a situation based on derivatives, and that's going to be really important as we study how light is radiated by atoms. For instance, if we think about motion equations in mechanics classes, you might want to know the motion of a projectile versus time, so you would end up looking at derivatives, something like dx dt, dy dt, dz dt. I'll just write the first two here. And then if you know the, these are velocities, of course, and if you know how position is changing versus time, and you also know the initial conditions, such as where the particle, the projectile started, then you can figure out where it moves versus time. So derivatives plus initial conditions. What's the equivalent situation for fields, which is what we care about? Now, the governing equations for fields in physics, electromagnetic fields, that is, are the Maxwell equations. And in compact form, I'm not even going to write out the full equations. I'm just going to remind you, and we'll discuss later, that divergence and curl of the electric field. There's an equation that specifies the divergence of the electric field and the curl of electric field. And there's equivalent equations for divergence and curl of the magnetic field. So there are these four Maxwell equations here. And those are derivative equations. These div and curl are derivatives in space. There are also time derivatives in these equations on the right-hand side that I haven't drawn. And if you add to these some initial conditions, then you can figure out how light is going to behave. What initial conditions are we interested in discussing right now? We're going to be specifically considering light radiated by an atom. So let me draw an atom for you. The basic ingredients that we care about are that there's going to be some sort of nucleus here and that it's got some sort of electron cloud around it, which I'm going to sketch in red, very much more elongated than it really is in nature. It's really quite spherical. But we're going to imagine that it's being distorted because it's being acted upon by an oscillating electric field. And I'm drawing it in this way with a dark arrowhead and a clear arrowhead to indicate oscillation versus time. So if we have some electric field versus time acting on this electron cloud, we're going to have oscillations where we're going to have positive charge at this end when there's negative charge at this end. And at other times, we're going to have negative charge at this end when there's positive charge at this end. This should remind you, in fact, of something like an antenna. If you have a long metal rod connected to some source, you can drive charge back and forth in this antenna, alternating positive and negative charge at one end, negative and positive charge at the other end. And you can build up something called a dipole moment, which is how much charge plus or minus Q is at this end and how much is at this end. I'm not going to define dipole moment here, we'll do that elsewhere, but the idea of charge being separated plus and minus at opposite ends gives rise to the notion of something called a dipole moment. That's what's happening here in this, in this atom. We've got charge in, of the electron cloud sloshing back and forth as the field from some electric field, which we're going to usually think of as a light beam, makes that electric charge slosh rapidly back and forth. So let me write down that this is an oscillating charge distribution. That's the key thing. And this charge distribution is going to be characterized by something that we call the dipole moment, which again is stronger the more charge there is and the more separation there is from end to end. That formula, which we'll deal with in more detail elsewhere, is this oscillating vector quantity, lowercase p, the dipole moment. And we're going to say that that dipole moment, we're going to write it as the real of a complex numbered expression, which is just some fixed dipole moment, which is sort of the maximum amount of charge and separation that we get, times a simple time oscillation term. And this is not present everywhere. This is present at the origin. At one point, we're going to call it the origin. And just for completeness, I've noticed that the frequency of oscillation, the angular frequency, is omega. I can also divide that by the speed of light. And I can define another quantity called the wave number, which is omega over C naught, a quantity you should have encountered in previous classes. So what are we wondering about here? We've got this oscillating charge distribution. 
And then this is going to broadcast light just like an antenna broadcasts radio waves out into space. This thing is going to broadcast, and I can now ask myself if this dipole distribution is present right at the origin of my coordinate system at some location out here, some vector located r away, I can ask, what is the electric field there? What is the electric field as a function of separation and time? If there's another electric field oscillating here, so this is the instant electric field, and this is what I will call the radiated ERAD electric field. Okay, so we've got our initial conditions, which is an oscillating dipole. We've got our field equations that tell us how these fields connect in space and time to each other in terms of changes. And this is going to give us an equation. Before I tell you what the equation is, let me tell you what else we're going to put into our classroom discussion of this. We have the basic laws of physics, the field equations. We have the particular situation that we want to understand with the charge distribution oscillation of a single atom namely a dipole. And the third thing that we have are what I would call the our Optics 262 observations. So what did we observe in Optics 262? Well, let me draw for you one of the experiments that we did in class the other day. And I'll sketch that out here. So we had a flask containing some liquid in it. And then we had a polarizer at the top of it. And these lines running along the polarizer tell me what direction of electric field oscillation is passed by that polarizer. So we sent light in from the top, and then we looked at various directions that that light scattered. And if we considered the light scattering in this direction and in this direction, so parallel to the slots and perpendicular to those slots, we found that the light here was bright, and here it was dark. Another thing that we observed, I'll sketch out, was an experiment where we didn't have a polarizer on top. So let me make that appear and sketch that for you. In this case, we have no polarizer on top. We shine the light in, and we try to pass it now through two polarizers outside of the flask. Both of them are oriented with their electric field oscillation past orientation being vertical. And what we found in this case was that it was dark for both. So these are experiments that we want to make sure that whatever equation we come up with for this radiated light, it has to explain these situations. So this is our preloaded situation of everything we need. Rather than going through all of the derivations first to arrive at the ERAD formula, I want to point out what that ERAD formula looks like, just to get you a bird's eye view of where all of this is headed. So what we end up finding is that the radiated field, as a function of position and time, so this is something we can plug into for any position anywhere relative to this atom at the origin, this is what it's equal to. It's equal to a couple of fundamental constants. Mu naught is one of those fundamental constants of nature, and pi is a mathematical constant. Then we multiply by the square of the oscillation frequency. Then we multiply by this term. Should look familiar in some form from previous optics classes e to the i kr minus omega t, that kr minus omega t makes you think probably about a wave propagating along. And then lastly, there's a cross product. And that cross product is that dipole moment, fixed dipole moment, the maximum dipole moment, crossed into r hat. r hat is the vector pointing away from the origin in the direction of r, but with unit length. And then that cross product is then crossed again with r hat. So this is a really important formula, and the, the key endpoint of our analysis. And what I want to wrap up emphasizing to you here is that we have these initial things we work on. We work through a lot of math, which I'm going to write in big, scary letters here. 
So we go through a lot of math and thinking to get to this equation. Once we have this equation, our rule for my rule for you being able to understand this equation, among other things, is that you can apply it to this situation here. This light up here is like an E that drives motion of little atoms inside of the container, which is like these atoms here. Those atoms then shake back and forth, their electron clouds shake back and forth, and they broadcast light, E rad. So if we understand this E-rad equation, we have to be able to explain in this situation and this situation why the light that was headed out in these directions was affected by this polarizer and why this light was polarized when it scattered, even though nothing in this environment here had so much organization. That's our overview of where we're headed. Now we'll move on to the actual hard math.